Functions always return something, so you don't need to write a return statement <laughs> in F-sharp. Um, if it returns nothing, then um, you just don't return it. So, for instance, here's our get new status method, okay? This is all you have to write if you're writing it in F-sharp. Just command the thread to sleep, and then put on the last line. The last line of code inside the function is whatever it's going to return. You can tell you're inside a function because it's indented. F sharp is like Python in that it uses, you know, white space is meaningful in F sharp, and in particular, indentation is meaningful in F sharp. F sharp is how you, uh, as how you de define and delineate scopes inside your functions. Um, that can be annoying sometimes, but most of the time I like it, especially after the code's written and I've indented it correctly because I get code that's very easy to read. Okay? Let is a keyword that just means I'm going to define something. Um, at least that, that's close enough. Here is F sharp syntax for a lambda. And it's a little more involved than the, than the C sharp lambda because you have to use this keyword fun uh, to show that you're having lots of fun. Um, that uh, is, is, is you know, three, three or four characters of extra verbosity it has over C sharp, but it also makes it unmistakable that you are writing a lambda here, and it's certainly not as cumbersome as what you have to write in Visual Basic. Um, this is the function, the lambda arrow. It's got, it uses the dash instead of the equal sign, just to be different. Um, I won't go into it, but uh, by default, all data in F sharp is immutable, meaning you cannot change it once you've declared it. If you want it to be mutable, as we have our status here being mutable, I have to use some special uh, syntax on here. But that's generally a good thing, because in functional programming, you try not to allow your data to change uh, as your code is executing so as to prevent bugs. And you have to be very explicit about it anytime you do write uh, code that will change things. Okay. Um, Another piece of neatness in F sharp is this. Uh, this is called the forward pipe operator. This takes something and feeds it as the first argument to what comes afterward. So this is like writing a function backwards. Um, update status is a function, and get new status is an argument that I'm going to pass to the function. I'm sorry. Um, what's returned from get new status name is what I'm going to pass to update status. Okay. Um, I'm not going to worry you too much about syntax matters here, just to point them out so you can understand what the code is doing. So my first few methods here in F# -sharp look, you know, very recognizably the same as they did in, in the other languages. Um, so here's the async delegate. Now, the one thing that's a little bit clumsy about F# -sharp compared to C# -sharp is that in C# -sharp, um, you can often get away with with um, writing a lambda and just let that be a delegate, okay? Uh, lambdas, are, lambdas in F-sharp are not automatically converted into delegates. So if you want to write a function in F-sharp and you want to use it as a delegate in some .NET API that expects a delegate, you have to explicitly build a delegate, and the easiest way is with the using the func and the action types, um, like we do, in, we do in other places in C-sharp and VB. Um, okay, now I want to get to the asynchronous workflows. So, asynchronous workflows are a feature of F sharp that it's had uh, since since the beginning. And F sharp, the first, I think the first RTM of F sharp 1.0 was around uh, 2005 or so. So, way back in 2005, F sharp was allowing you to write. Um, um, asynchronous callback code in a very um, in a very linear sort of style. Um, you do it by using this keyword async, which is not to be confused with the C sharp keyword async. Not that I think any of you would. Um, and then comes something kind of unusual in F sharp: curly braces, uh, which F sharp generally does not use. It uses them for workflows. And workflows are special blocks of code in F-sharp that 
execute in a special way. In this case, the thing that's special about it is that it's asynchronous. So what this async keyword is doing, even though it's not the same keyword as we have in C-sharp, uh, it's accomplishing the same thing. It's making the body of code inside these curly braces run asynchronously. It is, in effect, creating something like a task parallel library task, but it's not using the task parallel library. Okay? What it's using instead is an asynchronous callback on a delegate. Okay? So up here at the beginning, I'm creating a delegate. Remember I said it, you have to do it explicitly, so you use the func type, pass in a, a, func, a, a lambda, and then because it's a delegate, it's got a begin invoke and an end invoke. And what I'm saying here is that I'm going to create a new uh, special kind of, a, of an object called an async, which is very much like a task, that's going to be uh, running the begin invoke and end invoke methods for me. And then all I have to do is say, um, take that and then assign its results to um, a value called new status, and new status is a string. Okay? So that's a real quick explanation. I'm, I'm not going to try to elaborate too much more, but the, the point is that, and again, if, 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 if you're... If you spend some time uh, going over F-sharp syntax, this looks very much like synchronous code would look in F-sharp, but it's going to run asynchronously. And this works with any version of .NET because all versions of .NET from, well, I think F-sharp F -sharp has to have .NET 2.0. But from 2.0 onward, you've always got asynchronous delegates. You always build your own asynchronous delegates like I just showed you and all the .NET Framework asynchronous delegates that are already there um, are, are ready and waiting for F-sharp to use them. In fact, most of the time you don't have to use this async from begin to end. There'll be an F-sharp library version of, of a web client or HTTP um, or, or a file stream or whatever um, that has the um, asynchronous workflow method already in it. Okay. Now, the other one I want to make is that within an asynchronous workflow, well, first of all, in F-sharp, you can also use the, the task parallel library. Here I'm doing the same thing. Uh, this, is, this is the 4.0 version of task parallel library implemented in F-sharp. Again, it's, it's synchronous code that's passing a callback delegate into the task uh, run dot continue with, okay, just like I did in C-sharp. And then here I am using F-sharp's equivalent of the await keyword. Okay, so here's, here's async again. Here's something called async.await task. And here's a task. Okay? So there's a real short explanation of, of and, and here's, here's the F-sharp equivalent of that one-liner where we're calling the... Um, uh, the whole the whole shebang from one line. Now, while I'm here, I'm just going to make one or two quick points about F sharp. Uh, one 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 other quick point about about F sharp workflows. There's one significant difference which may or may not matter to you, and that is this: when you whenever you create a task uh, using one of the methods I showed you before in either VB or C sharp, that task starts to run immediately. Or I take that back. The task scheduler sitting behind it starts scheduling it to run immediately. Remember, I said it does it. It actually runs it when it feels like running. But you can't tell it to stop. Um, it's it's out of your hands once you once you say task dot run or task factory dot start new, which is a variation on task dot run. Okay. Whereas in F sharp, once you have um, an asynchronous workflow like this. Um, if I just stopped here, uh, okay. This is right. 
What's it complaining? It's complaining about something. Oh, never mind. Um, point is that if you create one of these asynchronous workflows, it does not start executing immediately. It does not schedule itself to execute immediately. It doesn't do anything. It waits until you want to tell it to start. And that happens down here with this, this the very end here, where I'm calling this thing called async.start. This is a method that will actually run, run the workflow or schedule the, work, the workflow. It doesn't do that until I call it. So I can create the async thing and just have it sitting around, and I may never call it. Okay? What, if, what if I'm not sure whether I'm going to need to uh, call this thing ever? And if I end up deciding I don't, I don't have to. Okay. So it's now seven, almost seven thirty. It's late. Uh, how many of you have been to my presentations where I ran over my time before? I mean, has anyone been to a presentation where I didn't run over my time? <laughs> um, okay. I have two more code samples to show, and if you like, I can whiz through them really fast, so you at least get to see it. There's not. There's some more stuff on the slides too, but. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll breeze past that in the interest of saving time. There will be a little bit of annotation on the slides for stuff I'm going to be covering. Um, and I'll confine it to uh, C-sharp, since everybody seems to like C-sharp. So, this is a project called Parallel C-sharp. And this has got two functions in it that it's going to call one after the other. This is for the situation where you want the code to run parallel, meaning if you've got extra cores, extra CPUs, if you've got the ability to run threads truly simultaneously, you want to. So this would be something you'd want to do on a server, uh, typically. Maybe on a client, too, if the client's doing a lot of work in some way. Okay? This doesn't guarantee that you're going to get any, any simultaneous execution. It doesn't guarantee that there are going to be threads available to, to do it. But if there are, this will use, you know, again, following its own internal logic, it will decide whether and how many threads to run, and it will try its best to make the best use of your resources under the circumstances. But everything will run concurrent or uh, in true parallel to the extent that it does run on different threads. It really will run in parallel, and therefore it should, if the threads are doing any significant amount of work, take less time total uh, than it would be if you uh, ran it synchronously. So how do we do it? There's two, uh, now this is actually part of the task parallel library. So again, you need to have .NET 4.0 or higher to do any of these things. Um, the first one here, the parallel.4 method, is available in .NET 4.0. So this code, this particular method could be, written, could be compiled in .NET 4.0 and work just fine. Ask me how I know that. Um, and so Parallel 4 is just like, is sort of like writing a loop, sort of like writing, you're using for, uh, for loop in C Sharp. It's a little different because well, it starts out being the same. You have an index, uh, an index counter of some sort. Um, you give it an initial value and you give it a maximum value. Okay. Here we're going to be iterating through an array. So we give it the array bounds, which starts at zero and ends with the uh, one. Okay, now this is this is a maximum. So this means for some counter uh, starting zero and ending when it, you know, continuing as long as it's less than the array's length. And then parallel four is going to take care of automatically incrementing the counter for us. Okay, we don't get a lot of freedom about how we want to increment the counter. We can't count backwards. We can't skip three each time. We have to go you know, serially one by one. Um, if you needed to do any of those things, you should ask yourself why you want to run in parallel. Um, but assuming that we're okay with just going through one step at a time, the next thing is a lambda. And parallel four will pass into the lambda an integer, which represents the index that we're at, uh, at, at that particular iteration through the loop. And once we're inside the lambda, we can take the index value, find the array element that corresponds to that index, pull, uh, and, then, and then what we're going to do with it is 
create a web client, um, retrieve the content that is found at that web address, at, the, at a web address which we pull from the array, and then we're going to write it out to the console. Excuse me, no, we're not. We're going to count how many, we're going to count how long it is and write that out to the console. Okay? Uh, let's go back and look at the array real quick. I sort of skipped over that. So here's the array. It's an array of tuples. Who knows what a tuple is? No hands were up. There's a hand. It's like a row in a database table. Um, kind of. That's, that's another meaning of the word, and it's related. Okay, a tuple, a tuple is a set. Okay, it's an or, it's a set it's an ordered it's 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 like an array but every element can be a different type. How's that? Okay, and here we have a, a tuple of strings, not terribly creative. I could have made this in you know arrays inside arrays, but just to show that there's something called a tuple in .NET, I made it a tuple. 